Good afternoon. Today is February 25. It's uh, 5, 10 p.m. in the afternoon. This is a meeting of the Streets and Sidewalks Committee. We're going to be talking about parking issues. If everyone, just to remind you, would turn off your cell phones, please, so we don't have any uh, uh, strange noises going on in the background. That would be helpful. Uh, to my right, two people down. We're kind of sitting in a strange position because we're going to have a PowerPoint pre presentation. Two folks down from me is uh, Councilman Brock Heath. He is on the committee. To my extreme right is Councilman Bill Lutz and myself, Bob Phillips, as chair of, uh, of this committee. Uh, Mr. Davis, you're going to start us off this afternoon as the Assistant Development Director. All right, thank you. As you call, in November, on November 15, 2018, uh, the City of Troy enacted a temporary moratorium on the um, issuance of time limited spaces. Uh, so essentially the time limits were not into play. We did not issue tickets uh, for those who exceeded the what used to be the two hour time limits. Uh, we took that time um, to provide an evaluation. So we hired a parking consultant. Um, we wanted to make sure he was as impartial as we could. So we hired an outside consultant uh, who was not familiar with Troy at all. Um, this way he would be completely objective to uh, our regulations and the recommendations he was going to make. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the process. Uh, in order to do the evaluation, we had our parking control officer. Uh, he went through um, the rounds for eight weeks. So he did four rounds a day for eight weeks, uh, mostly in December and January. Collected data on parking spaces, so uh, what license plate was in each particular space. We took that information. Uh, with the help of Doug Winning, our GIS tech, uh, provided that to the consultant um, in, in form that he could use, and then that's what he utilized to make the uh, parking recommendations uh, and the data he's going to go over soon. So uh, once he made those recommendations, he met with uh, staff a couple of weeks ago to uh, talk about the findings and what he had to make sure we could go over questions, if there was something in the data we could go over. Um, that small team consisted of members of the Troy Police Department, uh, some members of city staff and Troy Main Street Director Nicole Loy. Um, she could not be here today. Uh, she did have a death in the family, so uh, we certainly hope that she's doing well with that. But they did. Uh, we are expecting Mr. Fisher, who may be here in the audience. I don't know if he walked in. Uh, he's the president of Troy Main Street this time. He is here to speak on behalf of Troy Main Street. Um, and we know that during the talks with uh, Nicole that Troy Main Street was supportive of the uh, report that was provided by our consultant. So um, with that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our consultant, uh, Ben Elbert. Everybody hear me all right? Yes. Sir. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, as Tim alluded to, uh, my name is Ben Elbert. Uh, I actually work in the parking industry for uh, an asset management company, Campus Park uh, Management Inc. We actually uh, oversee and manage the Ohio State uh, parking system, but I'm actually not here on any official capacity there. This is purely as a consultant. Uh, I have uh, been, uh, just to introduce myself a little bit, I've been working in applied advanced analytics for roughly the last decade. Uh, started off originally as a graduate researcher at Ohio University where I did my graduate studies in applied mathematics. Uh, then went on, I've worked in uh, behavioral analytics, uh, uh, statistical analysis, predictive analytics, uh, and then now I work as a data scientist for the last three years. Uh, those are a lot of just kind of fancy and or corporate terms, really just meaning I specialize in analyzing data. Uh, it's my passion. It's <laughs> what I like to do. Uh, I uh, thoroughly in, actually enjoy every day coming in, and so much so that when I was asked if I'd like to do some additional uh, analytics, I said yes, I would like to. Uh, so our current parking system that we have, just so you uh, know that I'm not purely on the outside of parking, uh, we have 35,000 parking spaces, uh, which encompasses uh, between 40 and 50,000 permitted persons. And on any given day, you could have maybe 100,000 uh, drivers on Ohio State's campus. So uh, familiar with parking uh, in that regard, but to Tim's point, I uh, had really only known that Troy existed uh, in the sense that a couple of bands I know came from Troy. Other than that, I actually did not know much. I have enjoyed being here, though. 
Um, so really, the study that I conducted uh, covered the roughly 600 spaces in the downtown uh, Troy area uh, that is defined as extending roughly uh, two blocks uh, east, west, and south from the downtown circle, and then roughly a block north. Uh, and as previously stated, there was a two-hour maximum stay per vehicle with a $20 citation uh, enforceable uh, on any overstay previously. But since the moratorium, the idea has been, well, what should the parking system look like? How do we best utilize it? Uh, how do we make it more efficient? Uh, we'll see here in a few slides the system is being more utilized than it was a few years ago when Wolpert conducted a similar study. Uh, we'll also uh, see that there are pockets that can be utilized for different types of behavior. So dip parking you know, can come in all sorts of forms from the I just came for five minutes to I'm here all day because I either work and or uh, reside downtown. So uh, since November 15th, uh, we've, I was provided uh, that data, which is uh, essentially just a, a license plate, a space number, and then a, a timestamp saying this was when the uh, space was observed. Uh, and since December 1st, we've had that data relatively consistently going through January 31st. All right. So uh, unfortunately, because prior to the moratorium, not much in the way of uh, plate level data existed, which is how the majority of the analytics that I specialize in is done, which is at the individual level. Uh, by individual, I don't mean a single person, just some entity or, or, or behavioral aspect. Uh, there's not a lot to compare beforehand. So what we were able to do was look at uh, two key things, which was occupancy, uh, and then the next we'll see uh, uh, the other metric. Uh, so if you look at occupancy, we were averaging roughly about 62% of peak utilization when Wolpert did their study in March 2016. Uh, in the time frame that we looked at from December to January, December 2018 to January 2019, uh, that utilization is up to about 78%. Keep in mind, uh, this is actually with uh, a number of the, uh, the anchors of the downtown square not actually being fully occupied, as well as there are additional uh, uh, retailers, the brew pub, et cetera, that are planning to come in. So this is actually a relatively high utilization given that there is still ample space uh, for draw in, in the system. Typically in parking, uh, we say that uh, systems are uh, at least peak or fully utilized at about 85%, uh, unless you have uh, really advanced wayfinding. Uh, so if you go to a garage that has the overhead lighting and they have on each floor, here's the number of open spaces, and they're actually arrows pointing you, uh, even then we'd say at about 93 to 95%, those garages would be fully utilized. So the system is not what we would call full as of now, but there's not much by way of wiggle room. So you get in, you know, out of that uh, 600 spaces, so 15% uh, is about 90 spaces. So we're really talking about going up uh, only about 40 more spaces utilized at peak, and the system is quote unquote being fully utilized. So uh, definitely not a, uh, a, an underutilized system by any means. The other area where we were able to look at what was the change and shift in behavior was uh, the long term or the what would have been previously an overstay. So historically, on average, there were about uh, 50 to 60 two-hour violations that were written each month. As you can see in the graph, uh, starting in November and then December, January, uh, the number of people staying more than two hours just skyrocketed. Uh, that indicates that there was clearly demand uh, from a core group of people. We'll see here uh, that we can infer a rough percentage of how many people, but there's a core group of people who do want to park in their spot and then stay there all day and not have to continually move their car, which is not a bad thing. So uh, I think the downside to some of these comparisons is previously it was a violation in the moratorium, no violation. It simply allows us to actually infer what that expected usage was. But with the I may interrupt at yeah, this moment, uh, but with that number, that's there's no way at this moment to tell whether that is a customer or a uh, an employee downtown. No, okay. no, you're welcome. Yeah, so we did not do any sort of um, uh, what we typically refer to as origin destination studies. Uh, you can either do those from where did they leave their house to here, or when they left their car, where did they go to? We did no sort of origin destination studies. Um, those are always things that could be um, done at a later date. Uh, I don't do those, so this is not a plug. Um, it's just uh, on our data, we were able to say how long they stayed there. Uh, and again, that's how long they stayed uh, in that observable way. So uh, as Kim, the enforcement officer, drove around and recorded plates, we could say he saw a plate at 8 a.m. and then saw a plate again at noon. That's four hours. That plate could be there 
from as early as 7.59 or could have been <coughs> as early as 4 a.m. We just don't know. So it's, it's that observational period that we can at least say definitively they were there for an X number of hours. <coughs> yeah. uh, okay. Uh, and then what we were able to see when we look at unique plates versus stays, uh, it kind of goes down relatively uh, what we would expect about half-half uh, each time. So roughly 12.5% of Parkers stayed two plus hours, 7% uh, or so stayed four plus hours, and 3.4% uh, stayed six hours. The six plus hour mark is a little misleading. It's actually not as low as 3.4. It's, it's actually closer to seven. We'll see here in the next slide. Part of that is because not every day did Kim's route work out to where he made it to each space uh, those full three times that would require me to say that it was a six hour uh, time limit. Uh, we saw that it took on average about two and a half hours to make the full rounds of all the spaces. So given an eight hour workday, depending on the spaces you start on, it's not always going to be possible to hit every space in that amount of time. Um, when we did see, however, six plus hour parking, uh, it tended to average pretty close to 7%. Uh, so that's telling us that roughly 7% of parkers each day were in fact wanting to uh, stay there uh, for that long period of time, which if you look back on the previous slide, that's between four and 500 uh, unique plates in a month. Keep in mind that doesn't mean that on any given day there are four or 500 persons who are doing that. Just in a given month period, you're gonna see uh, roughly four to 500 people. I think in recent talks uh, when we had the meeting and Nicole alluded to probably there being somewhere between maybe 200 uh, plus employees just alone downtown, plus there's residents, plus there are, and I don't, I think uh, Nicole's numbers for the estimate was based on number of businesses. And we said, you know, if each business has three or four employees, that's, you know, about 200. That doesn't include the municipal employees. That doesn't include residents who are here because they work later in the day, that sort of thing. So it's uh, not a surprising uh, population, but it doesn't in, uh, at least imply that there is a large enough population to justify some sort of system for those persons. All right, so uh, these next two slides, I think, really help set up the parking recommendation uh, as, as it sits. Uh, I, I will have a caveat for that, but this is simply uh, just our way of looking at the data. So when I sit down and I try to figure out what's happening uh, with the data, what sort of behavioral usages are going on uh, with parking, some of the more common ones are where are people staying the longest and what spaces are being turned the most frequent. Uh, and that's what we did here. So this first slide is a heat map uh, that indicates where the most frequently turned spaces are. So the hotter it gets, so the cool being blue and hot being red, the hotter it gets, uh, the more frequently those spaces turned. Uh, now that is, of course, a, an inferred metric. Uh, we weren't actually out there seeing how often a car backed out and a new one backed in. It was just the number of unique plates per space that we saw. Uh, the key areas where you see a lot of high turn are here in the west of the square area. Uh, ignore this, this is the police station. So, uh, so they, they do uh, turn vehicles quite often, but you shouldn't park there, uh, it's, it's ill-advised. Um, and then on the southwest corner, uh, which is where the bakehouse is, uh, we see quite a bit of turn as well. Uh, and then also over here along the courthouse. So those, those were the primary zones where we saw a lot of turn, and that's actually what you would want to see. Those are your restaurants, your retail shops, uh, the larger draws, and they also si uh, are situated, uh, the courthouse of course is a pretty recognizable draw, and if you're there for the courthouse, you know precisely where you're going and why you're going there. Uh, for the square with the big house uh, being there, it's not a surprise to see that many cars coming in and out, given its popularity, uh, especially earlier in the day. And then over in the uh, west of the square, uh, the restaurants and uh, retail locations that are situated there. So this was not surprising. Uh, I think what it did help, though, to say was uh, there's parts of the system that are currently without any restriction being utilized for what we would like to see, which is in the high draw areas, those spaces are turning over. And we want to encourage that behavior because those businesses, uh, it, it's not a bad thing for a person to park in front and then walk around and shop, but they should at least be engaging in that economic activity or for the municipal buildings, they should be there uh, for the purposes. And then hopefully clear that space and allow another person who's going to come in there. And then when we look at kind of the counter to this, uh, this tells you how many unique plates we saw. Uh, it doesn't tell you how long they stayed. The other heat map that we can look at tells us uh, on average uh, where people wanted to stay the longest. So we chose four plus hours being the metric 
Uh, you've seen in the, uh, in the study so far, there's been references to two, four, and six plus hours days. But given that cycle time, four plus hours seems a more likely metric. Two hours is not actually that long of a time for a person to come down if they're having lunch and maybe walk around. Or we've also seen, um, heard from persons who if you come down for, say, uh, a hair appointment or another type of appointment like that, two hours might not be enough. So four hours seem to be a good metric of four hours spent downtown, you can clearly do it, but during the winter, there's not as much walking around. It's a lot of times driving to certain spaces, and then if I've got to go on the other side of the square, I'm probably gonna drive over when it's really cold. Um, so four hours gave us an, an idea of where are the places that people, I'm gonna park and I'm gonna stay for a long period of time. What was best about this was that it actually, uh, going into kind of talks with uh, what we think uh, good or optimal usage of the system uh, is and intended uses, uh, a lot of the thought was, well, how do we make sure that we have those main on-street spaces, not main street, but main road, so market and main, how do we have those main on-street spaces available for visitors, and how do we have the off-street spaces be utilized for more longer term uh, persons. It's actually a lot of already what's happening now. So right now you can see there is the South Cherry lot uh, here, which is a big draw. Uh, there's the South Walnut lot, which is a big draw. The North Cherry lot here. And there were some off-street spaces that were being utilized here, which uh, we actually did not, uh, you'll see in the recommended system, that was not, those individual spaces weren't included. But they are all off-street, which we've heard from a number, I think Nicole had alluded to uh, in some of our conversations, uh, that there was a lot of businesses that encouraged their employees to park somewhat off-street, don't park right on Main or Market, allow those spaces to be open. Uh, and from a behavioral analytics perspective, that's what you would want to see. You would want to see those spaces being able to uh, be used for visitors uh, and then allow the persons who are more familiar with the downtown area, be, have them park roughly one or so block off the main street and then they can walk to. Uh, the parking lots are conveniently located in the sense that uh, they aren't too far away for residents or for employees. Uh, that they feel like they're parking way off and kind of being ostracized. Rather, they still are relatively close to the destinations they want to go, and they're situated to where, depending on which part of the area you're working or living, you can actually get to there. Uh, so, okay. Hopefully all the time, so I'm doing good. Okay, uh, so before I actually go into the recommendation, I'm going to add a few caveats. Uh, every analyst loves caveats, and I have uh, a few. Uh, so one is, this is a recommendation. All right, I, I can tell you from the years of already doing this uh, in our own system, there's no perfect system, nothing that's going to make every single person happy. Uh, and as an outsider, what I've done is tried to present uh, what I think to be a good, uh, a good solution that helps drive the main goals, that, that uh, open availability for, for visitors, uh, getting uh, employees and residents to, to kind of know where they should park and, and know where they should go to. Uh, it's not, uh, I, I don't think it's going to be the absolute perfect or the final choice. I'm sure there's going to be talks and conversations, and I would encourage that. I think that uh, those of you on the council, those in the, in the, um, who are residents of the city, you're going to know your system better, and so hopefully this provides a good jumping off point, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily think of this. I, I have no uh, you know, uh, bravado that says that this is, is ground truth. This is just uh, what the data suggests would be a, a helpful system. Um, so. That aside, uh, I will uh, talk about what we heard uh, and what I was able to observe just from some time spent down here and then looking at the data. So in reality, the system being that it is uh, primarily used during the day, there are a number of municipal buildings, there are businesses, but then there are also residences uh, spread throughout. Uh, you're going to have different types uh, of users, but the two main user groups that we're going to have are, as we've said before, the employees and the visitors. In reality, visitors should be able to find spaces relatively close to their destination quickly. The reason for that is uh, if all of you have, I'm sure, done, you take out your phone and you're driving to a certain place, you put in the, the address on GPS, or you search for the, you know, search for wine and coffee, you, you search for the bakehouse, right? You're going to get directions to that, or to the courthouse. You're going to get directions to that location. It doesn't say uh, you should park X blocks away in this lot. Right, they usually just say, here's how you get there. So a person drives in, they pull forward. It's nice to have spaces available for them so that way they can park relatively close. Now they might miss a space because they, they say, hey, my, I'm a block up, I drive past, there's no spaces, but they saw spaces. They know they can turn back around and go into those spaces. 
Uh, employees and residents, as long, residents, on the other hand, uh, they know the system. So we want to make that uh, available. Uh, this was also uh, referenced as well in the Wolfer uh, study. So this is, I, I think, um, a, a relatively consistent theme. Uh, this isn't um, anything too outlandish. And so what we, uh, when I thought I used the royal we uh, from years of writing research. Uh, when I was looking at all these things, uh, really two areas came down to the quick turn type of, of environment, which are uh, the downtown square spaces uh, and then the uh, courthouse proximate spaces. Now, the spaces on uh, Main Street in front of the courthouse, I actually kept in a separate uh, block, which is a slightly longer term, just allowing for persons who uh, who say, I, I need to be there for a hearing, and I know I'm going to be there a little longer, I can park in those spaces versus the immediate proximate spaces uh, that would say, oh, I, I'm only going to be here. I know I need to go in and file. I need to go in and uh, get information, make a claim, something like that. I'm going to be in and out. Um, and then there was the, the means for encouraging downtown employees uh, and residents uh, the ability to park off of the main streets. Um, that's both a communication aspect, which is just encouraging those persons to do so, but then also is there a way to uh, actually guarantee them that space to where they feel more inclined to go to those uh, lots, those central areas. Uh, and then a system that makes the majority of the on-street spaces available. All right, so for the big reveal. So this here uh, is, as I said, a, a first uh, jumping off point for a recommended system that I think answers those main points uh, and uh, in my best understanding from what I've seen of the data actually helps keep going a, a fair portion of what's already being done. Uh, so as you can see, the red zones are the two hour max zones uh, and that's right around the, the square and then just extending that small half block off uh, as the, uh, to east and west, as those are the primary uh, places that I've, uh, that I've heard from, from conversations and, and observed where people tend to park there for those uh, quicker, uh, quicker visits. And then on the uh, west and north side of the courthouse, those spaces uh, being allowed for, uh, for, those short time, uh, for those short time spaces. Part of the, so obviously there, there's the economic uh, aspect of the downtown square which is just getting those spaces turned for businesses, especially businesses in that area that uh, deal primarily with quicker turn or, or shorter stay, at least sub two hour type stays. The courthouse is actually a, a slightly different reason. It's just knowing that uh, I don't know of many people aside from uh, attorneys, judges who enjoy going to court. Right? Court is usually uh, you have to be there or it's a, it's a struggle uh, or it's something that you don't want to do. If nothing else, you're probably uh, confused because you don't go do it regularly. So at least make the parking a little bit easier and try to have those spaces be readily available for them. Uh, and that's one of the recommendations there. We're still so then there's the blue uh, zones, which I've uh, indicated here a four hour max. Uh, and I will talk, there's actually a way to overstay without getting a citation uh, in the system that I'm recommending. Uh, but the four hour max spaces, you could park for free for four hours uh, in there. And those are just the, uh, the, the main street uh, the Main Street and Market Street spaces outside of the red zones. Um, we'll hit on continuous block first. That's probably going to be a, uh, a slightly larger topic than the paying for the uh, overstay. So one of the things that I think will make this system work more efficiently is this idea of what I'm referring to as a continuous block. The continuous block is essentially the idea that once I, am, once I park in a space in either the red or blue zones, I have engaged in the entire system and my time limit starts. I can move around, but I'm still time limited. Uh, you could take the approach, so there's alternatives here, right? One approach is if, you're, if you park in a red space, then anything after two hours in any space the rest of the day you have to pay for, or you could take it as you can only be in the red space for two hours, then you have to relocate to a four, but once you hit four total hours in the system, then you have to pay for the overstay. So there are options. This is not a, uh, you have to do this exact thing. Uh, but the continuous block mentality is essentially allowing persons to treat this as a zone. It makes enforcing slightly easier, uh, just because once you've seen a person, you don't have to worry about, well, which space were they in, and did they move so many feet, or do this sort of thing. The other, uh, the other benefit is that when you look at 
um, pay machines and uh, payment apps for parking. A lot of them encourage you to do what's called pay by plate rather than pay by space. Pay by plate allows a person to get on. I am going to be parked in downtown Troy for two hours. I'm going to pay for two hours. Halfway through, a friend says, hey, meet me over here. I don't have to walk. I can jump in my car, move over. My plate is covered because I paid my plate for a certain amount of time. And so that's the idea of the continuous block. Um, obviously, that is a somewhat conservative measure. Uh, I typically try to, in these recommendations, make the, make, I wouldn't say a, an extreme uh, recommendation, but make an, a recommendation that might be a little, uh, how, how should we say, a little uh, easy in the sense of it now makes it very simple. Right? Now, there's ways you can come back from that or you can make alterations. That's the point of what works for ultimately uh, for you all may not be this continuous block. It may be a hybrid version of that. But I do think that from an outsider's perspective, it does allow for the goals and objectives to be met uh, without necessarily having every person who overstays uh, have to automatically get a citation. Uh, so in terms of how you pay, uh, the thought being that after uh, staying for a certain amount of time. And I was actually uh, talking with uh, Captain McKinney before this. There are different ways that you can handle the pay. Uh, one is uh, a person, I, I get there and I park, and I say, hey, you know what? I know I've got a meeting today. Uh, I'm just going to park in this space. I know I'm going to be here six hours. I'm in a four-hour space. So I'm going to pay for two hours just right now. I don't want to remember four hours later to pay for two hours. OK. The payment app can just be set up. You can. Uh, work with those payment vendors to say, if a person paid for two hours and they were there in the space for six, they got four free, two paid. It doesn't matter when they paid, so long as it was before the time limit expired. Um, you can do other things where they can't pay until the actual time limit expires, that sort of thing. Um, there are different options uh, for those. Uh, but the point being is that by encouraging a payment tied to that, uh, it also helps drive what is the third uh, set of spaces. The third set of spaces are those lots, as you can see. Those are what I've labeled as placard. I put them as placard slash four hour, uh, meaning that if you park in a, in a lot, you have to pay after four hours if you don't have a reserved space, or you have the placard, which is a reserved space. Now, in this recommendation, uh, we'll get to uh, the nitty gritty here in one more slide, but in this recommendation, there are two types of placards. One is the all day 24 seven reserved space placard. That's primarily going to be uh, something that residents are gonna feel most drawn to. They know that they can come and go. They know that overnight their car's allowed to stay there. They know they have a space. And if someone's parked in that space, they have through the placard someone they can call, they can rectify that. Um, then there's also, uh, I refer to it as the non, I don't know what that was. Uh, there's the non-resident, uh, placard, which is essentially, I put it in as 20 hours. Uh, part of that is just uh, some of the restaurants and or, uh, and or bars, if they are open a little later, they might want for their employees to be able to park later into the night and not have to worry. Or you could do that as 12 hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and just say that after 6 p.m., you know, the system kind of converts <coughs> over to it's all free, right? So there's different ways that you can do that. But I do think there's an important differentiation because not everybody's going to need the 24-7 placard. That's primarily residents. So have some alternate placard that gives a guarantee of space during a certain, certain time limit uh, without necessarily having to make them pay the, the additional dollars. It's, it's, the recommendation is not large, but the additional dollars for 24-7. So by doing this, uh, what you're actually able to do uh, is make it to where uh, employees who choose to pay, uh, park in one of the main spaces on main or market, who choose to pay, it actually provides a mechanism for how do we price those spaces, right? So I think, I think determining what the price per hour per space is not always easy, right? Sometimes, uh, it, it, sometimes it's just simply we choose a number, and if we hear a lot of complaining about it or if nobody uses it, we back that number down. Or if we see that we're way too full and it's constantly being used, okay, we need to increase that because maybe we're, maybe we're having too much draw to it. Uh, by doing this, we're actually able to say, well, we can price them to where persons who choose to park in those spaces we want to be turned more frequently, we can price it to where their overstay will cost them at least more than, uh, and, and in this analysis, we did 50% more than the placard. Basically saying, Take the placard, add 50% to it, and divide by the estimated number of hours an employee parking all day long uh, in those spaces would, would run. Right? Now that's not for the occasional employee who says, well, I've, I've got a, a meeting with my financial advisor over here and I work two blocks down. I'm just going to go ahead and pay for the whole day because then I don't have to walk all over and be late. That's okay. 
right? That, that one-off usage is, is actually encouraged in these types of systems, right? There's, there's the transient aspect of where they are, in fact, behaving like a transient person. They've paid the additional, so they're not out of line with the system. But it's not meant to be so, uh, so cost-effective to where they should do that every single day. Um, yeah. And then, as you'll notice, currently, the other side off-street spaces right now, uh, those are not labeled as any. Uh, part of that was just uh, in my, uh, in, in the analysis, those were not frequently turned, nor were they frequently used for long stays. So they probably have kind of a mixture of usage and or are, are open more often. Those could, of course, just be labeled as four hours. Uh, you could make a different type of time limit for those. Uh, or you could incorporate those into the placard program. Right? So there's different ways you can do that. You can make them loading zones. Uh, there's all sorts of things. Uh, it's just with how many there were spread out, uh, it started to get into, well, why this versus this? So the lots made really clear choices for the placards. The square and the courthouse made really clear choice for the quick turn. And then the remainder of the main and market spaces made a lot of sense for the medium turn spaces. And uh, Mr. Albert, yes. uh, just to clarify, any of the spots that are not in these colors, you just talked about them, you're saying that those in this plan are just open to? They, they would be free. They would be similar to like the moratorium is now. There would be no time limit, no no charge for those spaces. Um, given their their limited availability, given the limited quantity uh, and their location, uh, it would essentially turn into what we refer to as kind of that hunting license of if there's an employee uh, who wants to try to seek one of those spaces out, it's not always going to be available. It's going to be a little tough for them to do so because other employees are also might be trying to do that to get around the placard program. Uh, in doing so, you might not buy the placard and might no, not go park in a lot. You try to go find a space. Well, those spaces are taken, and now you're three blocks away from where you wanted to be. Uh, so the point being is that uh, they could just as easily. I mean, in, in one of my original ideas, I was like, we'll make them all four hours. Uh, the downside there is then you also make it to where the enforcement officer has more spaces to cover. So if they can't cover their spaces as quickly, uh, they may not actually get to the persons. They're going to get persons who feel like they're able to get away with free time in the, in the system. So. Um, there are definitely ways to utilize uh, your, your current enforcement officer uh, and make those four hours or make, say, half a block extending in each direction or choose certain ones to make those. Um, but they also allow for the flexibility of making them possibly uh, loading spaces in front of I know, I know there aren't a lot of, but there are some businesses that are on those streets and so maybe make those short, really short time. You can make those 30 minute max type things. Um, but yes, uh, so given the, the amount of options after that, it would make this presentation extremely long. So uh, my thought being focus on the core package of the system, and then you have your ancillary add-ons that I think you all will probably be able to come up with uh, with feedback from the from the task force as well as uh, from the users. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. The, the red and the blue areas, yes. is that only until 6 o'clock, or is that 24-7? <laughs> I, so I, I'm imagining it'd probably be till six o'clock, and I'm, I'm assuming you're not going to want to pay for an enforcement officer to be on uh, all hours. Uh, again, I come from a system where ours is virtually 24/7. There are restrictions. Uh, my guess is downtown after 6 p.m. you're not going to have as much draw, uh, so there's going to be ample space. So most likely it's going to be until the six uh, six o'clock uh, time frame. Uh, that is actually a, a good. Uh, segue into one of the other things that I did not consider here uh, is what the recommended enforcement should be. Previously, it was the $20 citation for the overstay. So this here, if you choose to park in a time space, then you don't leave your space or you don't leave the zone in enough time and you don't pay, you could get the citation. Right? That, that option still exists. That, that enforcement is a key way for making the spaces available. The ability to pay for a day, so uh, at our recommended time, you'll see here in a second, the 50 cents per hour, right? A full day is $4. So a first time offender, you could say, hey, I'll waive your fee down to a full day rate, which is $4, all right? And that's kind of that olive branch to say, you know, you overstayed, you should have paid, next time you come back, make sure you pay, uh, but uh, we'll waive it down, right? It gives you that option. Uh, the other part is that, frankly, choosing what to charge for, in, for enforcement fees are a lot of times tied to the amount of manpower that goes into filing, uh, keeping track of all the clerical, et cetera. So uh, without that additional data, there wasn't the ability to say, here's what the citations should cost. So um, in that, uh, my idea is uh, the citation enforcement would just resume as normal, uh, just with these new rules that it adhered to as far as what is and is not a violation. If I may interrupt you just a moment. Yes. Let's stick to the usual format of the committee 
first asking questions and then everybody else at the end and that sort of thing, if you would, please. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Your apologies. Okay. Uh, so just to summarize um, all of this. Uh, so the recommendation is as follows. Create the two-hour max zone uh, around the downtown circle and the courthouse. Create the four-hour max zones for the remainder of the spaces on Main Street and Market Street. Implement a continuous block rule which prohibits space hopping in any of the two or four hour max zones by considering any space in these zones uh, to be a continuation of the time limit. Again, we talked earlier that could be options such as the two hour immediately enforces two hours anywhere or two hours in that space, then you can move over, but at most you have a total of four hours in the zone. Um, use the off street lots uh, that are currently in place for implementation of a placard program. Uh, with the remainder of the lot spaces being either four hour max or no time limit. But again, if there's no time limit or if they're four hour max, they're still going to be first come, first serve. So in areas where there's a lot of uh, employees who chose not to buy a placard uh, or while the placard program is being ironed out, those persons may not actually get that space in the lot they were hoping for, so they might have to park in a separate lot. Um, my original idea uh, is just to first offer an initial 50 placards. Uh, part of the reason is uh, is that there's no way to understand the, the demand currently. Uh, there, there was no ability for demand studies. There was no previous placard program that, would, uh, that had the, the data and evidence to say, here's uh, how many persons immediately came uh, for these types of placards at this price. Uh, and they're really uh, executing a survey for this would be cost prohibitive and time prohibitive. So uh, I think 50 placards, uh, the actual report does allude to kind of the, how that number was derived. Uh, essentially, uh, based on the number of residences, the number of apartments that are down downtown, the uh, national uh, average occupancy rate for rental units, and then the fact that on average, uh, each rental unit will have 1.6 adults. You reach roughly about 70 or so uh, potential driving persons knowing that there's probably not going to be 70 driving persons. Uh, 50 presents a nice number. You could go with 70. You could go with 90. I think it's just start with a lower number than what the ultimate placard program will have just to see how the response is. Right? So uh, in my mind, I would say start with the residents first and foremost, as those are the persons who will have the biggest reason to pay for a 24-7 placard. Uh, uh, make that offering available. Uh, see what the, the initial grab is. If the initial grab is 50 of them taken right away and there's a wait list, clearly there's an appetite for at least another X number for the uh, residents. If, say, 40 are taken, there's 10 extra, and then you put the call out to one or two businesses to just get a feeler for it, or you say, hey, we've got 10 available, first come, first serve, you know, but this is coming. You want to get in on the front ground and pick your spot where you want to go? Here it is. That will help you understand the demand. So. We can, uh, in analytics, of course, there are ways to do surveys and studies and uh, things like that to determine demand. Uh, but sometimes in, in these situations where you're not necessarily under a time crunch, one of the best ways to estimate demand is make an offering and see how many persons come back. You'll usually hear uh, in smaller uh, systems like this, you'll usually hear people say, yeah, I wanted one, but $25 a month was just too, much, too rich for me, so I'll just take my, my chances and park around. All right. Uh, my guess at $25 a month, you won't hear a lot of that. You'll hear some, um, but that tells you what people think of the price. If you make the initial offering uh, towards, say, employees, et cetera, and they just are grabbed up, $25 is probably a pretty good price. People are they're happy with it. They like that idea. Um, so sometimes uh, the scientific method of trial and error does work as far as estimating your demand, uh, but this would be my recommendation for the first start uh, of that. Um, and then uh, the final point is just implementing that hourly pay rate. So charging any person who stays longer than the two or four hour max limit uh, at a rate of 50 cents per hour, which was how we analytically determined a person would essentially, if they tried to be an employee and uh, pay, for, uh, pay for their overstay day in and day out, they would pay roughly 50% more than the placard program, and it would just make more sense for them to go with the placard program. Unless, of course, they just determined that they, they're willing to spend the money to park right in front of their business. At which point, maybe there's the option for that space being reserved for them. That option. Um, yeah. um, so I will say real quick, I know we only have a few more minutes left. Um, there are, uh, in the report, uh, I've mentioned there are different ways and technologies for how to uh, enforce these types of things. Uh, I want to say first and foremost, uh, 
being an analytical specialist, more familiar with the data, I've made recommendations of technologies I know of that help you track spaces or make payments. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to provide some of the ins and outs that, say, a technical consultant would be able to provide. But I do know that, for instance, on our campus, we use uh, we use a, a payment app such as Park Mobile. Uh, we also have pay machines. I believe you already have a pay machine uh, in the, uh, I think it's the South Walnut, uh, Cherry. South Cherry, Cherry, South Cherry lot uh, has the, has the pay machine. Um, those are good ways for you to make uh, persons who have smartphones they can pay from their phone anywhere they are, uh, or if they don't have the phone or if they choose not to download the app, they can go and they can pay for the spaces. The nice thing is, is because it's not pay per space, you don't have to have a meter at each space. You can put one of those pay machines every block or every other block, and a person can park. They can go and they can pay for it, and they know they're good. Um, so there are ways, uh, technology to help uh, track your spaces, to help enforce the payment. Uh, it doesn't have to just be through uh, parking meters. So. Uh, and All right, thanks. Actually, yeah, aren't you, you're concluding. I, I'm finished with mine, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to open this up at the moment to questions of Mr. Uh, Albert uh, from the committee because he is under a time constraint and uh, needs to get out of here. So, uh, Mr. Heath or Mr. Lutz, do you have any questions at this time? I guess the only thing that I, that I heard in your presentation and I'm still struggling with this because it seems like, now let me just ask this, what are the problems with the current system that we have right now that need to be addressed? The current system under its previous or under the moratorium? Under, under the moratorium. Under the moratorium, I would say the biggest concerns would be uh, the non-guarantee or the <coughs> the non-reliability of your spaces in front of key res uh, in front of key municipal buildings, restaurants, retail, that sort of thing. That's especially it, it's it's demonstrated already now in some way, but it will be especially so as more and more retail establishments come in. I know there's been talk of the remainder of the square being filled out and then um, the brew pub. There's other things that are going to come in. Having those spaces available for visitors is a key part. Uh, people who go to a, a place and feel like they can't park often find themselves not wanting to necessarily go back because it's too difficult. So the, the recommendation here is simply a way to uh, encourage long-term <coughs> long parkers uh, to move away from those street spaces, allowing for uh, retail and restaurant and municipal buildings to have their persons park close. So the turnover is not uh, enough at this point uh, in, the, in the two hour zone that you're really frustrated? I wouldn't necessarily say that it's not enough. I think that's a tough benchmark to pin down. I think what it is is that um, in, in typically in parking systems, guarantees are better than open-ended. So if I know that spaces will likely be available where I'm going to go, I'm more likely to go there, versus if it's if it's a, a, a toss in the air, I may not be as inclined. <coughs> Again, that, that of course comes down to behavioral and whether or not I have to go versus want to go. Um, but with retail and restaurant especially, uh, parking does tend to play a role uh, in, most, in most surveys that we've looked at for whether or not a person chooses to engage. Uh, I'm going to call a time out for Mr. Elwood because uh, apparently uh, Mr. Fisher with Troy Main Street has the time constraint. So I'm going to ask him to come on up here and uh, we'll hit you some, with some questions here okay. a little bit later. I, I also, Tim, I'm, I apologize. I don't know if Tim had mentioned, I unfortunately also have a hard stop at the six as well. Do you have any immediate questions of Mr. Elwood? No. no. If he's got anybody else on council have questions of Mr. Elwood? I have yes. questions, but I don't know. Do you want us to come back or do you want to go quick? Well, they're both under time constraints, okay. so if we can keep it quick. Should, I'll go as quickly as I can. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you mentioned that we don't have the four style work buildings. Yeah. That's going to obviously make a difference in your impact, correct? Yes. And I guess the, the to go quick, the placard four, the purpose of the placard program is to assign a spot, right? It is to make guarantee, yes. If you went to a placard eight, eight I find, I'm a downtown business owner, that the lots are underutilized yeah. at, to a significant number, even now when they're free. Yeah. If you went to a placard eight, would that impact your When you say results? placard eight, I apologize. In eight yeah. hours, instead of placard or eight hours in the lots. Because there's oh. no lot that's, that's even, I mean, if you're going to park yeah. for a long yeah, time, there's I, no lot that's... Yeah, and that was the mention for the, the other option is just no time limit at all. Um, I think it was just in, in order to present some sort of way to make sure those, it, 
putting a free space right next to a reserve space sometimes has this feel of, well, why would I pay if I can just pay park for free? So sometimes encouraging a time limit helps encourage adoption of your placard program. I think in all reality, the goal would be for all of those lots to be entirely occupied <coughs> by placards. So that way that's where residents and retail Residents, retail, restaurant, and the municipal employees go to park, and they just know that's where I park. When you want to encourage lot use, yes. so if you if you were court if you were going to court for the whole day, yeah. that would be a spot where you could go. That could be, or you could just pay park close and pay the additional fee. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one one thing that I have, you know, and I consider myself of average intelligence yeah. when when it comes to smartphones and all. But that sounds confusing as yeah. sin. Exactly. And that's yeah. why those pay machines are so important. We have them even on our campus. As you can imagine, the majority of persons on, on a campus have smartphones, but it's still worthwhile to have pay machines, and I, I completely agree. Uh, to give you an example, Chicago Chicago parking meters, for instance, Chicago, very for, very forward city. Uh, their their entire system of, of many thousands, tens of thousands of parking uh, meters all have those pay machines. It's an essential thing. I totally agree with you. Yeah. And, and the second thing, and you already mentioned, but I, I just want to uh, throw into, I, I have concerns for those businesses who are on the side streets. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, I've, I've gone and talked and yep. saw firsthand that people don't move from absolutely. in front of their businesses. Absolutely. So. I, I, I agree, and I think that uh, that's definitely what the, the starting point, not the final product. Right. Agree. Okay. I know you mentioned earlier that this is done in the winter time. Yes. Obviously, those numbers would we would expect an increase in the traffic yes. flow in downtown yep. Yep. during summer times, which would help benefit the two-hour yes. turnover. Yes, and, and that is so. This system, uh, and that's to. Um, Mr. Lutz, to help answer your question, part of the design for the system is not just the right now and the eight weeks that we studied, but the knowledge of what is to come and the knowledge of how it's already being utilized and what the ideal or efficient utilization would be to help answer your question as well. So, yeah, exactly. I want to make sure I give time for Mr. Fisher. Are there any other? Oh, sorry. That's all I ask. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so appreciate much. It. I appreciate you all Thank having you, me. Sir. Thank you. Um, Thank Mr. You Fisher, there. would you please come up and advise this is from Troy Main Street's uh, point of view. Good evening, Council. Uh, as Mr. Davis stated, uh, Nicole had an emergency and was unable to attend uh, this, this evening. So uh, Troy Main Street has also prepared a very limited scope study, right, with overall very positive results, um, very, very limited in negative commentary as far as the moratorium period. Um, so ultimately the message that we have for council is that we're here, you know, Main Street's mission is to strengthen the heart of our community. And we believe that parking is a big part of that. We also believe that our partnership with the city and with council, um, we are often asked to help to roll out to market and to promote that. So the message we have today really is that we want to help make whatever change, if any, is enacted to be successful. As, as, as uh, Mr. Albert said, we're going to have to relearn this as citizens, and we want to be a part of, of helping our citizens do that. So what, what have you heard uh, from the business community downtown of what they are looking for, what they would like to see as an iteration of the various systems that we've had in the past? We, Mr. Phelps, really, I think it's going to come down to different people are going to be satisfied with different things, right? We've got those big house folks. We've got those folks that are going to want short-term parking, right? Uh, some of the only negative comments we've received in our limited study, which was just under 100 folks that we queried commentary from, uh, were those in and out spots. It was uh, those quick stops under 20 to 25 minutes, and because those spaces were now full, perhaps by a resident or perhaps by, by maybe someone who's staying the whole day. Uh, there was just a, a small degree of frustration there. You know, I, from all of the comments that we've got here from emails in the past and stuff, that there's no way that anybody, everyone is going to be happy. We can't do that. Yeah, okay. Okay. Right. Knowing that it's a difficult decision to come to. Okay. Exactly. Well, thank you. Any questions from the committee to uh, Mr. I think, uh, <clears throat> yes, I think that uh, we went over a little bit, but the 
the heat maps, I think, are showing that things are turning over where they should and things are staying where they should naturally, it almost mm -hmm. uh, seems like. So when you're out talking to the businesses, <coughs> and obviously everybody has a lot of different standpoints depending on which business, but the overall feel of the complete free parking has been positive? It's positive, probably at least 95% positive comments. It's been very, very limited scope is what we're seeing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. If we could keep the comments down, please. Appreciate it. Mr. Lutz, do you have any? I have no questions for Mr. Fisher, but thank you for Thank you. Any other council folks? I'm confused now. So is TMS in support of the proposed modifications, or is TMS supporting free parking? That's a good question. You know, I think having not been able to bring that in front of our full board to have an official position, our position is that we want to help the city. We are here to attract people and visitors to downtown. Uh, so whatever the policy is, the program that does that, that's what we want to be in support of. Can we clear? How, what, is your, what is your position going? Are you, are you presenting something? Because this was the first presentation for council. So are you going to present this back to TMS members? Correct. Okay, yes. so so we should we should expect a position from Troy Main Street relatively within the next week or so. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes, once we can get the board together, we will provide that to Ms. Knight. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm committed. Uh, uh, communicated this, but I anticipate that we'll have another meeting off of this. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Davis? Yeah. Uh, so do you have any more questions for Mr. Elbert? Anyone? Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your time. <coughs> Hopefully we can get you out of here. It's 601. It's 601. Mr. Titterington, I'd, have, I'd ask for some question of you for some license plate information about locals and out-of-town visitors and things, did we? Uh, yeah, Captain McKinney uh, confirmed because uh, we could pull that information from the smaller subset where we actually have to follow up with a citation because th that's at the point where we would uh, get the address information, but overwhelmingly people just pay based on the ticket that they receive, and so we don't do any follow-up to to add the, the address. So trying to separate out between local and, and non-local folks uh, would not is not available at this point. Okay. 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 Thanks. Okay. I'm not to mention that before. Sorry. Uh, that's Sorry. Right. Um, at this point, uh, the committee, uh, Mr. Lutzer, Mr. Heath, do you have any questions of staff? I'm uh, interested in hearing from the businesses if there's going to be time from that for that today. Yeah. <coughs> Here we'll, uh, yes. Not to not call it the staff, but uh, maybe for just the uh, police side of things, how is this? Uh, how has the free parking turned out? Has there been issues with any kind of people arguing, enforcing anything like this? Uh, we've yeah. had some complaints on, on both sides. We've had complaints okay. received, I think, that Troy Main Street talked about as far as people parking in front of other people's businesses. We've also heard a lot of positive things uh, through our Facebook page, which we okay. simply uh, reposted Troy Main Street's posting, and a lot of positive comments were on that. So we've, we've heard comments both ways. Okay. And from your perspective as the arm that's going to enforce any kind of issues that come up the free parking has worked well for you guys has it worked well uh has it caused, it's, has it caused it's issues, decreased I guess. the amount of enforcement we've had to do it's it's yeah. decreased uh, the amount of manpower to do enforcement but we do have a full-time parking control officer whose job was to do that two-hour enforcement and uh, a large percentage of his day was entailed with the two-hour enforcement so now that right. he does not do that uh his position uh, as far as the future of that would be, I guess, a question. All right. Okay. Along that enforce Thank enforcement uh, aspect, handicap parking and other issues surrounding outside of time limited, there, he was still 
in the business of enforcing those. Yes, there's a lot of other bad ways to park besides time enforcement that <laughs> is able to continue to enforce. <laughs> gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else else on council have any questions of Captain McKinney? Yeah, just, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Captain, um, I'm not sure if you've got this information, but from a complaint standpoint, were more complaints coming from businesses or from visitors or people that were considered customers? Before the moratorium or after? No, the during, during the moratorium. During the moratorium, uh, most of those complaints were referred to Troy Main Street, specifically Nicole okay. Moy. She was asked to And they were coming place. from businesses? Uh, concerns, any concerns. Uh, I don't really have those numbers. You don't know whether they were? There were a few people during the process that approached Kim directly uh, from businesses that were complaining that the spots were filled in front of their business. Okay. I was just trying to get a feel for whether it was the businesses complaining or the customers complaining. Yeah. Uh, the what what we received were the businesses complaining. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Um, at this point, I think we'll open it up to citizen comments and or questions of staff at this point so we can get things on the record. Uh, as I indicated, I think that there's probably going to be another meeting because there's still information that this committee and council will need to consider in order to fully uh, absorb this and come to some sort of decision. So if you would come to the microphone, make your statement or, and or ask your question, state your name, address. Uh, so that the uh, clerk can record that. So it's a free for all. Hey, Bobby, Bobby, can they state their business if they're uh, representing a business? Ah, please do. Yes, if, if you do are a business, please state that. Please. Hi, I am Cindy Schaefer, and I live across the street from the courthouse on 20, on 24 North Street. I want to tell you, since the moratorium has been on there, there's been no fighting, no screaming, no anything. The traffic has been moving really good, and um, Officer Kim has done his job. Let me tell you, he, I can tell you uh, that uh, if you are at 12 inches or an inch and a half in the square. So this is um, toward the city council meeting that I wrote back in November. It says, rotating spaces every two hours, five times a day, five days a week, Monday through Friday from May 14, 2018 through November 14, 2018, equals 27 weeks, approximately 675 parking moves for one spot. Note, signs posted Monday through Saturday, 8 to 6. I am requesting a permit parking space in front of my residence. I request that Troy City Council authorize North Street West Side to remain open parking. Fortunately, I have a handicapped pa um, uh, place card, which allows me to move on a daily basis between three to four times a day. I'm constantly moving one space up and one space back or parking across the street. Now, I have been not parking there this winter because of the uh, cold, and I need, need that area in order to lift my things. It is in my opinion that citizens who, rot, who reside in the city of Troy be exonerated from the two-hour parking rule within Ordinance 35104, parking near curb, handicapped locations on public and private lots and garages. No, this would include handicap or not. I researched this issue with help of Captain McKinney. We had a progressive discussion on parking. Between July 2018 and October 2018, 40 Two tickets were issued on North Short Street. July had five, August had 10, September had 12, October had 16. I had asked for the number of tickets written on the west side because of our outdated system that was not possible. We have no clue the turnovers in each parking space, which one is popular, which side brought in the most ticket revenue, and the weather rated variables. We can only assume the courthouse doors and possibly at the corners. The downtown area would be included in my observations. I have been instructed a long time ago that I could only use an extra two hours once in 24 hours in the city of Troy. I thought I was following the rule. Note, also, Kim also was very helpful in explaining the parking ordinance. Not so, according to Captain McKinney, who directed me to section three, uh, three, uh, th point, uh, three, 
4, item G, which states, the motor vehicle is permitted to park for a period of two hours in excess of the legal parking period permitted by local authorities, except where local <coughs> ordinances or police rules provide otherwise, or where the vehicle is parked in such a manner as to be clearly a traffic out, uh, hazard, according to the two-hour rule. That is number G. Captain McKinney went on to explain that the item G includes the right to move from one two-hour parking space plus additional two hours to a second two-hour parking space plus additional two hours, equaling a total of eight hours without a ticket. Uh, are you all following me? It's very confusing, isn't it? I, the point I would like to make on item G is vague. It does not clearly spell out exactly the point of the item G. In my opinion, item G needs to be revised to state the two hour plus the additional two hours time slot so we, the citizen Troy, know are on the same page. In May, I contacted the Disability Rights of Ohio and Columbus. Attorney David Scott advised me to obtain a doctor's written note confirming the exemption of my disability and contact the ADA coordinator or the Office of Traffic and Parking in Troy. According to Captain McKinney, there was no coordinator that he knows of. I have been sent to the City of Troy, the Miami County Health Department, Riverside School, Miami County Job and Family Services, the County Building, and the Human Resources to locate an ADA coordinator to no avail. After speaking several times with this, Mr. Funderburn, he suggested that I address this issue to City Council. So I asked, does 351.04 item apply to my situation? And who is our ADA coordinator? I am asking for approval for a parking space in front of my residence. Finally, in my opinion, having a break from the two-hour rule is a breath of fresh air. The atmosphere around the courthouse has been uplifted. Free will is a blessing. May it continue to come in months right into summer. Thank you. Since I um, wrote this letter, I contacted the Great Lakes uh, Director of ADA, uh, who was recommended by the Ohio State University ADA Office. Uh, the, the Ohio State University ADA Office also helps everybody in the state of Ohio. And it's just not their campus. So they directed me to the Great Lakes, which is outside of Chicago. Their first question was, why is there any two-hour parking in front of a residence house in the first place? And, and nobody can, um, obviously, that's part of this whole thing. So that, those are, these are my comments. And um, the people who go into the courthouse, you know, they're trying to get their lives together. And it's human nature. Um, to come out and be upset uh, having a ticket, and I don't think they, I don't think they mind the tickets on the lines and being out from the curb, but when they are in there and they're paying another ticket because they pass a two hour and they're doing a class because they have two, I think two, two classes a day for driving over there. I'm not real sure about that. I checked into it. I think that bothers them more than anything. And, and to live there and, and have the people be upset all the time, is, it's just been impossible. But it's been really quiet this last four months. And I'm sure uh, it may start up in the fall. So that's my issues on here. And I still don't have an ADA, and they're telling me we don't, the city of Troy does not have one. So um, if anybody knows where they are, that I can get this solved. And I, I've been putting this off to come and talk until I thought maybe this might help you know how some of us feel. Thank you. Thank you. you bet. Uh, Connor Heron, 2 East Main Street, owner of Heron's Market. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Council. I don't think there's been this much energy put into parking in the last decade that I remember. So thank you, Council, for doing that. Um, I had a couple questions for Ben. Um, I'm not sure if there's a way that we can contact him via email. Yeah. Um, and also, it would be wonderful, and I don't know if it is, and maybe somebody can help me, but the presentation that he presented, is there access to that online at all? Um, or a handout or something? We did receive that. We can probably put it online. Okay, perfect. It's on the computer, so we can pull it off. Okay. He didn't take it with him, so. Okay. Um, a couple things I would ask him that would, would be good, I think, in going forward in this is, um, how does the city relay this sort of information to the citizens if something is enacted? Um, do we know 
if there's studies on signage, how to appropriately put signage in downtown to relay um, somewhat of a complicated system. You know, I don't think it's overcomplicated, um, but it'd be good to have an effective way to communicate that. And then he comes from Columbus, and maybe using Columbus as an example, do we know what the average distance is from a customer coming downtown from where they park to their destination? Um, you know, in my opinion, it's not a bad thing to walk to where you'd like to be, whether it's a block or two blocks. Um, I think that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, and I have been, since the beginning of the year, working on the 2 East Main Building, what is formerly known as the Art Vault Gallery that will forever be known as Heron's Market. Um, I've been down there eight to ten hours a day, five to six days a week, working in and out of the building, from building to dumpster. Um, and I've taken good notice to just the cars, specifically in that parking lot. I can't speak to everything else downtown. Um, but there have been cars that have been parked all day, every day there. You know, the same cars, presumably either people working or people living. Um, some of those people own more cars than there are people in the, in the building. So, you know, just things like that. Um, those, those spaces are being taken up. And I am guilty of it, although it is temporary. I have parked there all day in that quadrant, um, but again, temporary. So I, I know that that is useful to have the um, extended parking free and unlimited. But I know for myself in places like Bakehouse and some of the coffee shops, we do rely on that turnover. Um, so that's all I got. Thank you guys again. I appreciate the effort for figuring this parking out. Thank you. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> Hello. You all know me, but Brian Kemper, <laughs> 1013 South Crawford. Uh, just a couple comments and thoughts on, on this. Um, I'm somebody who used to rent a place downtown and decided I was spending more money on rent and all that, and I'd rather just go pay every day and sit at a coffee house downtown and use their internet and stuff. And I spend about $20 a day minimum downtown. I come downtown and park six days a week uh, minimum, sometimes seven during football season, I'll park by sub house. Uh, but I do park downtown six days a week. I do try to park in the lot behind the coffee house. Uh, during the moratorium, there was one single time ever that that lot was full and I parked on the street. Uh, as I'm thinking about this, you know, I'm spending money. I usually go downtown for a few hours, do a lot of work, go pick up my daughter from school, go to lunch a couple times a week over at Heron's, which thank God I'll be moving downtown. Uh, I go to Lafayette Express a couple times a week and I go to usually lunch on, on Main Street on Fridays. And then I take my daughter to work, and then in the afternoon I come back downtown and I park for a couple hours and get more work done. So thinking about like this continuous thing, that's that's really going to be something like if I park two hours in the morning, work, go pick up my daughter from school, all that, I come back, but I can't park in another spot downtown, I might not come back and spend more money uh, if that's the case. And, and it's, you can ask the business owners I go to, I do spend money downtown every day. Um, things like that. Or even on Cherry Street, uh, one of the things to think about if that becomes a placard lot is all the residents that live on Cherry Street every Friday night move their cars into that lot as they're instructed because for three months we have a farmer's market. So if that's a placard lot, then the residents then have nowhere to move. And also the people that own placards would lose their spots every Saturday for three months. So there's things like that that have to be, I think, considered into that, uh, those placard spots, because a lot of the vendors are given parking spots in that parking lot. So if somebody pays for a placard lot spot, they lose it for three months of the year on Saturdays. Uh, I guess, it, is the money from the placards going to go to paying for the lights that are over those lots and for the snowplow? I know the city snowplow broke a wall behind, uh, right by the police station the other day. It was an accident and stuff, but is that going to come out of taxpayer money or is that going to come out of the placard money? Because the taxpayers shouldn't be paying for the plowing and the lights if, if that's money being sold, those spots, and they can't use those spots. So just a couple things to throw out there with that. Uh, I personally, from every business owner and everybody downtown that I've talked to, um, has said it's been great during this moratorium. For me, who uses downtown six days a week at least, it's been great. Just want to put that out there. I think there are some other questions. And I think that, uh, to be honest, the way I've seen this is now developing and that there's been a lot of pause and a lot of talk about it and all the questions, I think it's been going very well. And I'd just like to see more conversation and more of this stuff thought about. That's all. Thank you, Brian. Margaret. 
Bank Houseboard Company. We are, um, as far as the report is concerned, we're definitely needing two hour turnover in the circles and all the quadrants and maybe some out. And then four hours, I thought that was a great idea because I know there are um, salons where people need to stay longer than two hours, but we definitely need high turnover. And there are four, right now there are four 15 minute, maybe more, maybe two in each quadrant. And we highly need those as well. Our customers in particular um, have been very stressed out and complaining that they can't find a parking place during this moratorium. Mm -hmm. And we've and we've written down license numbers of employees in the 405 building who've been parking there all day. And our sales are down. And you know, we're just waiting it out, so I'm ready for it to re resume where it was. Um, even when I drove in tonight at 10 till 5, one of the employees in the 405 building came down, got in his car and left in the square, in the quadrant in front of us. Um, the quadrant wasn't full at 10 till 5, but his car was there all day. So we would appreciate that. And I, and, um, we're, I thought that the proposal was limited number of um, placard spaces in the Cherry Street lot. Or is it all? Yeah. Are they proposing a limited number? There's a limited number. A limited number is great for business owners and employees who want to pay, I guess. But it yeah. wouldn't interfere with farmer's market if the residents moved in, I don't think, if that's limited. We had addressed that at the last uh, uh, street, uh, Streets and Sidewalks Committee. As the placarding system, that was a consideration that's already been yeah. talked about. So it's an, an area that would have to be addressed or uh, <laughs> process in place once that did occur, if it does occur. Yeah, well, you can put us down for three. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Thank Chair. You. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, just to throw a little wrench into the farmer's market, uh, Troy Main Street, unfortunately, they had, uh, Dave had to leave. Uh, Troy Main Street has requested that, uh, at least for this coming summer, uh, they want to experiment by moving <coughs> the farmer's market to the uh, two northern quads on Saturdays. So the uh, the issue of South Cherry being blocked off on Saturdays, uh, at least for 2019, will not be a problem or a complicating factor. Let's put it that way. Okay. Thank you. The other side of Main Street, I'm sorry. The north, the north side. Both of the north side. On the north side. Yes, sir. Uh, Sam Weiss, Genesis Graphics. I have a business on a side street. Do you have something, Tom? Yeah, I just have uh, one thing, Sam, Go before ahead. you start. Uh, I wanted to ask Mrs. Bay, then, is she in favor of keeping the moratorium or against that? That's why I was a little confused on it. Against. Against. Okay. Let's keep going back to meter monitor spaces. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Um, a lot of you may remember I sent um, a collage of pictures that since day one of the moratorium, I have had issues on the side street. Not one time did I send you a picture of a client or a customer in anywhere of the downtown area that was abusing the moratorium, but I had not counting today, the prior 12 days, I have had two vehicles parked in front of the two spots in front of our building on a side street. Both of these people are employees around on Main Street that start at 6 a.m. and work to about 2 or 2.30. At 6 a.m., they could park anywhere, but they choose to park in front of my building. I have customers who came in. I had one who came in the day before, it was Thursday, and drop some items off. He parked in a residence driveway because there was no place to park on our street. When I looked out there, there are two spots in front of our building and three directly across the street. And since it's a small street, those three are utilized too. They're all two hour parking. All five of them were taken by business owners and employees. We don't have a parking problem downtown if you can educate the business owners and employees to not park in front of somebody else's business, but you can't do that. 
I've been downtown for almost 25 years. It's never happened. I said this back in November, that what we had now is not a perfect system. It doesn't include everybody. I don't need two hour parking. I need 15 minutes, that's all I need. But somebody next to me might need two hours. So we can't all get what we want, but we sure can't have free parking because if the moratorium were to continue, I would start a war tomorrow with the business owner around the corner and confront them. And I'll tell them, I've got four vehicles sitting at home right now. Maybe I'll just bring all four of them in and I'll park them in front of your business and I'll just move them every three days. I mean, this is literally what it's come down to, that the moratorium is good in one sense, but it's terrible in another. We just need to continually move vehicles to help the businesses. And the only vehicles we need to move right now is the business owners and employees. And for the Reader's Digest version of what Ben had, I don't know about anybody else, but that got confusing as all get out in some instances. Um, trying to police two hours, four hours, placards, lots, some places open. Oh my, I'm, I'm in favor of just two hours everywhere. Um, it's, it seems like to be the simplest, cleanest version that has been working. Doesn't work for everybody, but it has been working for majority of the businesses. Thank you. Kelly Snyder, uh, director of the Troy Rack 11 uh, North Main. Um, our biggest concern, obviously, is the lot that is right next to the wreck. Um, if that becomes a placard, um, that would be very difficult for our um, preschool and daycare um, people coming in. I'd like to read um, just a comment from my, um, my director, Janet Lark, who cannot be here because she is at the daycare. <laughs> um, she said, after 25 years of working downtown, I could not see a discernible difference between the availability of parking with the meters and without. It seems to be working fine without paying an excessive regulation. Also, if they make our lot for permit parking only, our 48 preschool families will be particularly negatively impacted four to six times per week, pick up and drop off two or three days per week. Especially the four-year-old classes who have only 15 minutes between morning and afternoon pickup and drop off right around the lunch hour. They will have to park blocks away, carry younger siblings to get the preschool students, and even if the lot isn't affected, our parents have to carry a ridiculous amount of nickels just to spend four or five minutes running inside for drop-off and pickup. We often hear parents complain that the parking control officer is in the lot specifically during those times trying to catch the parents who forget or who don't have change. They literally are dropping off, running in, and running right back out. Um, another employee that I have, and by the way, we have 15 employees at the REC. Um, another employee says, as a downtown employee, I have truly appreciated the free parking. It's been like getting a small raise and hasn't made parking any more difficult to find. I feel like everyone has been respectful with the time that they are using spaces and really appreciate not having to pay. Um, so for us, obviously, we, we have... Um, spaces in front of the wreck on Market Street, but then the, um, I feel like the placard program at, in that lot would be very detrimental to us. Um, in the evenings, in particular, I realize that um, the parking now it, it ends at 6 o'clock, but many of our um, parents and um, participants in our programs are coming in around 4.30 or 5.00 staying for a couple of hours. Um, I just think that's going to be very hard for them to find spaces. Um, on any given uh, afternoon and evening, we're having 20 to 30 people come in and out of that lot, picking up, dropping off, or staying for a class and then leaving. So a placard, I don't think, would be effective for that lot. I would, I would very much like to see that lot stay either metered. I would like it free, but I understand that may not be possible. But metered would be better than a placard, I believe, for that particular lot. Thank you. Rob Davey. I own various properties around downtown, including Southwest Quadrant. I've seen during this moratorium, same cars parked there every day. It's a problem for the businesses because 
there's only 25 parking spots in front of my buildings, 75 people working inside. If everyone parks there, there's no room for customers. This four hours or the two hours plus you can pay the fee at the booth means that you can turn it into an all day parking just for paying an extra $4. There's no sense in that. And as the lady from the rec just pointed out, her employees are taking advantage of this and taking parking spots from the customers during this moratorium. She said it's been a raise for them because they can park there for free for the day. There's no advantage to the customers. There's no parking spots when they take the spots for the day from our customers. Thank you, sir. Okay, I just um, Most of our employees, um, preschool in particular, they're, they come in at nine in the morning and um, they're uh, usually part-time. So they're there for maybe four hours and then they leave, come back for the next four hours. Um, our daycare is only there for a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours in the afternoon. Um, I do park there all day, but I pay for that, and I will happily pay for that. Um, so I, I, um, I just wanted to address what that, what that is. But that lot is very rarely full, so it is available to folks to park there most of the time. So. Thanks. I just have a quick question. On the signs, it's Monday through uh, Saturday. Uh, what happens to Saturday parking? Because that's on the, the signs that you put that up all around. It has six. It has the same thing as through the week. That's confusing. The signs on the two-hour sign parking has Monday through whatever. That's six o'clock. It also has it on for Saturday. It's parking enforcement. I don't know. I mean, are we? We could enforce that parking. I mean, we okay. very infrequently would, but that is just part of the current code. Right. Okay, because I, I, people have asked me since I live downtown, or they'll ask somebody about it, and I wasn't sure because I'm, no, I'm not seeing um, the parking patrol come on Saturday, so I didn't know if you were thinking of changing those signs or leaving like they are. Okay, thank you. Right. Anyone else have any comments? Hi, I'm Allison Polenkamp. I own Samos Reme at 123 South Market. So in November we talked, um, one of the points that I brought up was that for us as a destination business that we pull from Cleveland to Kentucky and Indianapolis to Athens. Um, Two hours doesn't work for me in my spaces, so I've got families who are coming and spending a couple, three hours going through whatever classes that they're learning or the um, subject that they're learning, and then they've got kids with them, they've got friends with them, family, and they then want to go explore. They at least need to eat usually, and so parking um, in front of Samos Remy and then having them move if they buckle up their kids, they're leaving. Because if they're gonna go to another spot, they're not gonna unbuckle them, buckle them back in. And that's, you know, they might have one, they might have two, they might have a pumpkin seat, but they come, we have our class, they need to feed baby, they need to change baby. Um, maybe they're there playing. And we've seen a real uptick in the last few months of people coming in, what we're doing, and what the city's doing, and Main Street, and the advertising, and the Visitors Bureau, it's working because I've never in the 10 years that I've been here um, seen as many people come in and say, you know, we heard about Troy. I just had to come and check it out. And oh, wow, you've got all these cute places, but we want to go roam around. What am I supposed to do with my car? Or I saw the free parking and like, you know, anybody who'd been there before said, that's different, please explain to me. So the overwhelming response for us has been, this is amazing, please tell them that we like this, I'm coming downtown more. My people who are coming from out of town said, it's so much easier, it's easier for us to be here, to drive up, we're gonna spend at least as much time in Troy as it takes us to drive round trip. Um, so it's been a real benefit for us. Granted, we have, we have parking, we have spaces. I may feel differently as, you know, we've got salon spaces there that are um, 
people are sitting for three and four hours and they need that time to, if they're getting a cut in the color and, and a blowout and whatever. <laughs> um, and as we add popping off right next door to us, we may see those spaces fill up relatively quickly along our part of the block there. But the church parking right across the street, you know, the spaces in front of the church are, are almost always open unless there's a funeral. So I don't feel like we have a shortage of spaces. So I know that I'm speaking from um, an advantageous place when, and we're very lucky for that. Um, so I would like to not see any two hour or timed space happen in front of our part of the block. Um, but I absolutely do see the need for that around the square. So, so you're talking about the right 100 across. and 200 mm -hmm. block of mm -hmm. uh, right. South, 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 South City Hall. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so for us, between the alleyway and um, the end, it, it works really great for us. Okay. Do, do you know how many of your customers park on Franklin or Canal and then walk over? Um, not really on Franklin. Um, on Canal, yes. It used to be before the uh, lots of vans and suburbans parking in front of the shop with multiple kids having through third row seating. We, when it was hard with the two lanes and they were hanging out, we had a lot of people parking on Canal um, because they felt it was hard to get out. I have always just told people, you know, just wait for the red light, <laughs> and it's easier, but um, it's not because of the three-hour parking that was on Canal. It was because it was easier to back out. What I'm seeing now in terms of that, and I have never felt as difficult to get out, but I do now. One day I waited four red lights to try to get out of there because no one is treating that as parking as a parking lot parking space where you need to slow down and let those people out. They're just racing by. And the speed, although it slowed down, in my opinion, for the first two or three weeks, has now ramped up even faster than it was. People zoom by to get, they don't want to let you out. So... I've never felt weird about backing out. If no one's parked to your left and you can do that little um, turn and get parallel with the road, it's easier to jump out. And now if you're, if you're blocked in, you're going to sit there and wait because no one's going to let you out. So now that's the comment. Okay. Is I'm parking around the corner because I can't back out because no one will let me. So um, it's not because of the three hour versus two hour. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. One more thing I wanted to address. In the, the question about wintertime versus summertime, I know many people that I know, I live about a mile away. Uh, I drive my car a lot less in the summertime. I used to ride my longboard downtown a lot until the city decided to prosecute me for riding on the street in the bike lane, but I think maybe if we could relook at that, because most cities do allow longboards as... Uh, and rollerblades is alternate transport. I'd love to ride my longboard again and drive my car a lot less. But uh, I think during the summertime, maybe a lot of people that work downtown might walk more. So I think the numbers might be different summer and winter. Uh, obviously, when it's you know 10 degrees, I'm not going to walk all the way downtown. But I would I would drive my car and park a lot less if if I was allowed to ride my longboard downtown, which I'd love to do again. So. <laughs> Joy Weiss, Trinity Tax Service at 14 North Walnut. I also live next door at 18 North Walnut, and I own the rental property next to that at 22 North Walnut. I also have the problem with employees of other businesses parking all day or the majority of the day in front of my business. These two particular spots in front of our business were two hours. And since I live right there and I work right there, most of the customers, it was a good turnover. They went to Lopez, Pratt, and Siebert. They were dropping stuff off. Only needed 15 minutes. Now the problem is they park in my driveway so they can go and drop stuff off. On top of that, my clients don't have anywhere to park. So the free parking is not getting it, at least not in that section. 
Now, it could be four hours does work in some places, but right in front of a business that has customers coming and going on a regular basis, they need less than four hours. And it is sad. I'll tell you, on the other side of my building is an alley. And if you want to see poor business relationships, you go argue with somebody and tell a, another business owner, you can't park in that alley all day. Okay, my mom and dad live on the second floor. If there's an emergency and the ambulance can't get in there because you're illegally parked, we have a problem. So then you finally have to say, the next time you park there, I'll just call the police. And it is sad. We're all small business owners. You know, we're in this to help each other. We want to see downtown grow. The more customers that come to the restaurants see my business. The more customers I have come in, I can direct them to go to a restaurant or a coffee shop or the bookstore. But the free parking in some areas is just not going to get it. And I would hate to have to go around now because I do have employees parking in front of there and explain to them that I would appreciate if they did. What's my alternative? I'd appreciate it if you didn't park there. Well, it's free parking. Okay, then I will not cater to your business. I'll tell people to go to some other coffee shop. Uh, I'll park my car in front of your business. I also have, I don't know, two or three cars. My mom and dad's got four or five cars. You know, I don't want to be out there. I wouldn't do that personally. It would take too much of my time to move my cars all around. <laughs> but it doesn't always work. And I know we're not going to uh, appease everybody. But you still want to look at the growth. I don't need my clients to come into my office. They can email me everything. I can mail them everything. But they'd like to come to downtown Troy. And they'd like to be able to park close enough, you know, that they could walk to my office, not drive around. Plus, Saturday, I don't know what, what was going on downtown Saturday. OK, I live at 18 North Walnut. I had to go out two times and tell people they couldn't parallel park right there because it was in front of my driveway. It was my driveway. So I don't know what was going on downtown Saturday, but the traffic was, uh, it was crazy. And I did ask them, I said, are you trying to park here? And they said, yeah. I said, well, this is my driveway. And they're like, it is? Uh, the car's right here? <laughs> So yeah, I would appreciate if the free parking were not right in front of our business. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Uh, at this point, uh, any other questions from council? Committee? <coughs> Anyone else? I think, uh, <clears throat> obviously, uh, we're going to go through this more, and there are going to be future meetings. It's just the, off the top of my head from what I'm hearing, it sounds like the free parking has worked really well, except for some places, right, in front of Bakehouse, in front of the side businesses that are getting parked in front of the whole time. There's no safety issues with the free parking from the police side. 95% positivity from Troy Main Street. The heat maps are showing that it's working. The alternative that we saw here today is confusing and seems like unnecessary with all the parking times. I, this is right off the top, but what if we do free parking and sprinkle in 15 or 30 minute parking spots throughout where they're needed? If we do three or four 30 minute spots in each quadrant and then maybe on the side streets where people are getting parked in front of, let's if there's a business there, let's put some 30 minute parking spots in front of them to help those guys out. Uh, but other than that, I think the free parking is working. Is that? Is there any? Uh, I'd like to hear if, if there's good or bad to that. I would just add. Sounds great. We have we, what we have in front of us is a convoluted solution to a problem that may or may not exist, and 
when we did the parking moratorium, and the data that we have from Mr. Elbert shows that people have been well behaved using this parking moratorium for the most part. You brought it up, Brock. Places where we needed the high turnover, the high turnover is occurring. Mr. Elbert in his report said that those people that we expect to be long-term par parkers are using the off-street lots that have been provided for them. So it goes back to what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Well, our spots are non-reliable. Well, what does that really mean? I, well, it, you throw up good questions. I, I think what we're looking for is simplicity and continuity uh, uh, in our downtown parking. I'm not so sure that I, uh, I personally am in favor of just free and then sprinkling in because we do need uh, some control and some conciseness so that uh, parking enforcement can operate in a, in a uniform manner. But I do, this has been a problem, if you go back and look at history since 1970, uh, the same issues arise periodically. So uh, systems have changed over time and that sort of thing. So I think we're looking at, at basically modifying to a degree what we had in existence before the uh, moratorium. So I'm, in my personal uh, view, I think the uh, time limits generally, as, uh, as the consultant has laid out there, is a good thing, and particularly in the, in the uh, quads themselves. Um, I don't know necessarily that we need uh, more shorter-term parking, uh, but the uh, but the two-hour with the uh, one or two 15-minute uh, spaces that we have in each quad uh, seem to be to be working. Now it's the outside edges where we do need more turnover uh, and assisting some of the side businesses on the off, uh, side streets to get that back in place to create turnover. And the interesting thing that I had not uh, uh, took into consideration in, in my thoughts until uh, one of the, the uh, speakers uh, brought it up was the uh, time limit in front of some of the residences that we have on the side street. So I think that that's something that we also need to look at. So at this point, I don't know that we're looking to do come to any uh, uh, agreement, uh, but we have several questions that staff needs to look at uh, and uh, provide the, that information back to us. Could you summarize this for us? I think I just did. Would, 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 the, would the chairman entertain a recommendation? I'm sorry. Would you entertain a recommendation from what we have provided? Uh, let's hear the recommendation. I, I would recommend that given the five um, items that have been proposed by city staff, that we only act on the first recommendation. And, and I, would, I would add a caveat. We create a two-hour zone on the quads, on the first block of East Main Street, first block of West Main Street, and along the courthouse, but only for those spaces adjacent to the courthouse? Um, I, I'm actually going to need to see that in writing, quite honestly. OK. Um, so basically, two hours. Uh, yeah. I, I, OK. Before you don't want any exercise there, but uh, so I think maybe uh, Providing that in writing and getting it so that we to can distribute yeah. okay. and, and to council and to council and okay. so that we can get it out there and uh, have that question answered. Uh, it's a good thing. I do think that the uh, apps and the other payment systems that Mr. Elbert talked about were very confusing and it's not something that's conducive for uh, Troy, Ohio at this point in time. Uh, and some of the other payment methods and, and charging for parking. So I think we need to uh, have Sue, the, the, the notes that she's taken with the questions that have come forward uh, for staff to look at and uh, have those questions answered as people have come up. And we need to see what the, what the recommendations are off of that. So we're, you want us to provide questions to Sue to explain Experiment with, or look, or look into it further. I guess. Well, if, if you've got a recommendation that you know off of this, what, what you would like to see, uh, I think that we need to explore that a little bit. Let's get it. 
and, and lay that out so that, that there's no question about anything. So I can shoot that to Sue. Basically, it's going to be to simplify everything. It's free parking unless you pull up to a sign that says 15 minutes. And then that one's 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, so I can put that into some writing. Is that what you're looking for? I think so, because I think what I'm hearing right now is that we've got three different opinions. Right. Right. Here. right. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're not going to be able to make a recommendation yeah. tonight on this. So. And I'm not sure. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, I'm not. Uh, and I'm not sure that I'm not sure how you expect us to weigh in on that. Um, you know, some of the comments that I've heard after, uh, like like Mr. Heath, a couple of the summary points that you made, I'm not sure that staff would agree with. Um, the hot zones showed that those are hot zones because meaning they're not working as well as other zones, not the opposite is what I thought you were saying, for example. Uh, that's from Ben's recommend or from Ben's presentation, uh, and that's why in those areas he's uh, recommending higher turnover or short, you know, shorter time limits or time limits. Period. Can I ask a question related to that? One of the hottest zones was right in front of K's, and it's being recommended for four-hour parking. Okay. Uh, I mean, we're not we. You, you mentioned simplification. So right. Ben tried to take that into consideration. Okay. And when he looked at places like K's, where we have an abundance of off-street parking directly across the uh -huh. street, he tried to take that into consideration. Okay. So he, you know, as, as we're talking, one of the concerns I've got is right now, we, uh, before pre-moratorium, we had 15 minute spaces, two hour spaces. I believe we even had a, a couple of one hour spaces. Yeah. Um, we had three hour spaces, and then as you go mid block or blocks away, it became free. So, you know, getting to more simplified parking and including K's in the four hour block was just because the rest of those two blocks were, were four hours and there was that off street parking across the street. So, I tried to massage his recommendations to try to be coherent. Okay. Uh, that, that's why that was the way it was. So, you know, we just want to know, we, you know, the staff, as Tim mentioned earlier, you know, we tried to stay out of it. We wanted Ben to, uh, to make his recommendations. We didn't necessarily agree with the breadth and scope of his recommendations. Uh, I, I, I can say that we were not ready to uh, make any kind of investment in advanced technology because we don't think we're nearly there yet, for example. Um, the, uh, Mr. Uh, e. Elbert's uh, map showed four hour going all the way, I believe, to the park, to the post office um, or close to it, uh, when in fact we were wondering if that was, it was necessary. So I apologize, I will never be able to say the name of this, the, the business that uh, uh, Allison. It was Allison may, uh, mentioned, <laughs> and that's just me. Uh, but in that area, you know, we were trying to be sensitive to to that area, knowing that maybe it doesn't ha need to have. Uh, but we're, you know, we're trying to uh, to simplify the zones, and, and which is one of the reasons why we uh, uh, Ben had recommended free parking or unlimited parking um, on the side streets. We knew that there'd be comments and concerns both ways, uh, which I think this uh, uh, scattering of, uh, of comments, citizen public comments, has shown. Um, one thing that uh, I, I think uh, that, that Mr. Fisher did not uh, mention uh, and will confirm was uh, he did say that he wanted to meet his full board, and I believe their meeting is March 11th. Is that, that I believe, and you know, at a minimum, uh, maybe we ought to be, maybe we ought to find out what's going on there. Ms. Mr. Heath, um, one thing that you might have missed is that yes, Mr. Fisher said 95% were positive. Uh, he did also say that was a very small subset of yeah, his members. 100 people. Um, and so, okay, so. I think that's why they want to talk as a board and look at that as part of their long-term vision. So I don't know what 
in additional information that we as a staff and that's why I'm kind of struggling and I want to make sure that we can get you what you need. Is there for meetings open to the public? Trent Main Streets, I do not believe they are. No. I believe yeah, you have to be a they're member. a private entity. They're not a yeah, governmental I agency. You have to be a member. Right. You have but to be they're a having a say in what happens in the government. They, they are they're they're providing the their recommendation. Correct. Thank you. They're having the same input that you are. There's nothing behind the scenes. They've got, they come here to give their recommendations. Um, but uh, for that, for them to disseminate this report to their uh, business, the business people downtown, uh, because this is the first time they've seen it. So there's time that's needed for that. I was curious. Right. Gotcha. I think, uh, I tell you what, uh, run your uh, scenario uh, again, your recommendation, Mr. Lutz. Uh, the recommendation that I have is to um, follow recommendation number one that has been provided on the memorandum from, uh, from yourself, Mr. Titrington. Um, only item number one, creating a two-hour maximum zone in the following areas, the all four quadrants of the public square, uh, the 0 to 99 block of East Main Street, the 0 to 99 block of West Main Street, uh, that would be the 0 to 99 block of Short Street, but only on the east side, and then the 200 block of West Water Street, only on the south side. Say the last one again, Water Street. The, it would be the 200 block of West Water Street only on the south side. So it would be those spots that are directly adjacent to the courthouse. Everything else would be unlimited. Everything else would be unlimited, yes. So those that have the side business will still have the issue of people parking in front of their business. Cor correct. I mean, even with, I, I, I'm, I'm no, very just, sensitive to... Uh, the folks on North Walnut Street, but even under this recommendation, this recommendation that's been provided would make those unlimited spots as well. Even worse. Well, but you're looking to change that recommendation so everything is on the table. Correct. Um, and the only thing I would make a comment, Chairman, is that this, we are looking towards the future, too, of more residencies downtown, fuller capacity, and if we are really looking to develop where we're having visitors come more often to downtown, which Allison mentioned there seems to be more of. I, I wouldn't want us just to make a rash decision to say right now at this moment, uh, this is what this is what works. When really, let's think long term. And I know payment plans right now aren't the best, but it's something I think we have to think about um, down the road. Maybe we don't do it now. So I think it's good that he brought these things because it's things that. These are parking experts, and I know we all like to think we're parking experts because we went out and observed uh, our own time when we came to downtown. I came yesterday and said, oh, we have no parking issues, right? So I, I do think the experts there and consultants there to sort of open our eyes and think long term, not just this moment in time. This is what's happening. Um, I think that uh, as an alternative to what Mr. Lutz has indicated, that my, as I'm looking at this, I do like the red and blue uh, zones that Mr. Elbert has on, on, uh, on his map for the two and four hour. However, I would like to add uh, or take a look at particularly businesses that are on the side streets for a portion of that block usually to encompass those businesses, to include those in the two-hour spot. And then our lots that are uh, the Cherry Street lot and the Walnut Street lot and uh, the Rec and uh, behind Basils in that area to uh, possibly be unlimited parking. The placard system, I'm not hearing much support from that from this group at this point. At least no one else is, so I'm, I'm not in favor of it at this point. Right. Um, so is those two uh, alternatives, unless you have a third one, Mr. I would like to add in the third, uh, as far as the free parking everywhere, except for areas that are that are kind of needing that, um, in front of Bakehouse, in front of Winans, uh, we can throw some spots in there, uh, especially on the side roads, because 
Mr. Uh, Phillips just mentioned putting some two hours in there. According to the businesses we've heard, they don't need two hours. Uh, so to have blocks that are confusing and not sure where all these are, I think the simplest version is just free parking, uh, except for the 15 or 30 minute spots that we can clearly designate right in front of the spot, like we've done before. Yeah. Um, seems like it's worked. Uh, the 15 minute parking has worked well. You can see it, it's very visible. There's no reason to complicate all this with different blocks and different things. And the heat map that I'm looking at that was showing support for what I'm saying is on page seven. Um, so I, I, can, I can give that recommendation as well. Let's keep it simple. Everything free except for the hot spots. Let's help those people out with 30 minute parking. So that uh, those alternatives could also be included in the packet that goes to Troy Main Street. And uh, we can talk after, uh, after they have met. And they are meeting March 11th, did you say? We believe so. Um, do we need to extend the moratorium at this point? I think we need to confirm their meeting first, and, and then we can certainly bring Meet something again. if we need to. Got it. Okay. All right. Any other items to come before the Streets and Sidewalks Committee? Can I just add one, one side? Sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, will there be another committee meeting? Yes. Yeah. After, okay. after Troy Main Street. Okay. Uh, has their information and we've got the other maps as we've laid out here so we can look at those. Uh, th this being the Streets and Sidewalks Committee, it, it seems it seems appropriate to bring this up. I'm hearing a lot more concerns from residents trying to navigate uh, pedestrian safety issues crossing at the, pub at the uh, crosswalks on the public square. And if there's things that the, the city staff can look at and make recommendations on how to improve the safety around um, those, inter those pedestrian intersections, for lack of a better term, I would really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Duly noted. Thank yeah. you. We are doing that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Can I ask a, a city to find, to go one thing? I, I walk through downtown all the time. Other than my neighbors, how many off, how many businesses are there that don't have off street? Because I, I mean, I could, I would not have a problem with Genesis and Trinity having a 30-minute spot in front, but I can't think of anybody else that has that problem. So if, if they're an isolated incident, let's fix it for them, and and move on. I can't think of anybody else that 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 impacts, and I don't. I mean, I walked that street coming back from Kays today, and it was pretty wide open. But I don't know if they were open today. But, I mean, if it's a problem and they're the only people, there's, there's no problem, in my opinion, doing that for a 30-minute if you've got a business downtown. And I can't, I'm trying to walk this square, and I can't think of anybody else that has a no off-street parking uh, that has a business on a side street. Perhaps we can identify that. Sorry. I saw the eye roll. There is no eye roll. <laughs> down. Uh, oh, okay, gotcha. All right. And, uh, any other comments? Uh, right. Seeing none, then we'll uh, adjourn this meeting, and we will meet after uh, we have learned uh, when Troy Main Street is getting their in information together. Thank you all for coming.